Well, thank you, Steve. That was a wonderful introduction. This conference is wonderful. Uh, it was great seeing some people here who we've been organizing against Roundup in New York City and also other people who are fighting against the pesticide spraying all over New York City that was uh, initiated under Rudolph Giuliani as mayor in New York, then Mayor Bloomberg, another presidential candidate in the news lately, continued the spraying of all over New York City of malathion and pyrethroids to kill mosquitoes. And then it went on now under Mayor de Blasio and it's continuing. I believe that the glyphosate aspect of that is going to be a subject of a hearing on Wednesday, this uh, tomorrow morning, and it looks like we're gonna be able to kick out uh, Roundup from New York City parks for the first time. We'll, we'll find out tomorrow, but we have a lot of city sponsors on the bill. So how does this, uh, how does this go onto the screen over there? Okay, so thanks. So this is, I always start talks with Steve Biko giving homage to those who came before us. Do people know who Steve Biko was? He was a South African anti-apartheid activist, the founder of the black consciousness movement there, who was thrown in prison in South Africa, chained to his cot, such as it was, tortured using cattle prods, electric cattle prods sold to the South African government at that time by the United States government. And as the leader of the movement there, uh, one of his great quotes was that the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And part of, uh, let's think about that for a minute, please. Because one of the things about that, about this talk, will be dealing with the mind of our minds and the minds of the oppressed and how we can break out of some of the formulaic ways of viewing the world and also of, of viewing our own resistance to it. So, so thank you, Steve Biko. So the fight, thank you. So the fight against Monsanto's Roundup, uh, the politics of pesticides, which is the name of my book, focuses not so much on examining the dangers of each and every pesticide du jour, but on the ways by which corporations such as Monsanto, Bayer, Dow, DuPont, Syngenta, Novartis, and other ma manufacturers of pesticides and pharmaceutical companies are allowed... Oh, okay, thanks. ...are allowed to mask the truth about their products. The question is, how is it conceivable that despite worldwide medical and environmental exposures of Monsanto's product, Roundup, its dangers and designation as a probable carcinogen, New York is still, under de Blasio, continuing to deploy Roundup to kill weeds, just as governments around the world continue to do everywhere. What the hell is wrong with them? And what can we do about it? And also to think about, I mentioned this last night, what do we mean by a weed to begin with? What do we mean by a pest to begin with? One person's weeds is another person's medicine, organic, natural plant medicine to deal with all many of the issues that we're facing today. So what is a weed? A dandelion is a weed, yet dandelion tree is great for the liver and for you know, so we're, we're talking about reframing the way we think about things and questioning and not accepting what we take for granted, our hidden assumptions that we don't even think to question often. Good morning, Bob. Bob is a fellow uh, WBAI volunteer, WBAI radio volunteer who's helping you all get 
Gary Knowles and everyone else's premiums, so thank you, Bob. So each corporate polluter is over and over again seen as an exception or a bad apple in an otherwise benevolent system. Thus, we have arsenic begat DDT, DDT begat organophosphates, organophosphates begat pyrethroids, pyrethroids begat uh, glyphosate, and now glyphosate begat, begets, 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 decamba. One after the other after the other. We beat one, and they just come back with another one immediately. So part of my talk is to try for us to understand what we can do so that, because we just get rid of one and they just come back with another one. And the, we never break from this treadmill, the poison treadmill that we're all on. So for every environmental movement success in pressuring governments to ban this or that particularly egregious pesticide, the industry spits out a newer one and the cycle begins again. So victories on individual pesticides are undermined by a methodology that examines each chemical in isolation from the others. Our job is to not see them as isolated, rotten apples in an otherwise wonderful barrel. Our movements need to go deeper beyond the usual concerns about a particular chemical or corporation. If each expose is thought of as the exception, that's what I was just saying, is thought of as the exception to the rule, then the system itself is assumed to be fundamentally stable and beneficial, except for those few. The system itself, though, is fundamentally unstable, unsustainable, and harmful. It generates an approach to nature and to human life in which corporate considerations, as evidenced by Monsanto's actions, are par for the course. And I mentioned, if you're following along, uh, the text there about golf courses are among the most leading abusers of pesticides. So using par for the course is, is my, stupid, uh, <laughs> my stupid attempt to bring humor into this horror that we're facing. I don't think it's okay if anyone gets cancer. Maybe it's okay if we get rid of them and throw them out, though, yeah. So effective, what is an effective strategy for us? We must grapple with the realization that we will never succeed in saving ourselves or our children and the environment by opposing one pesticide or one pipeline at a time. Considerations of more radical frameworks and actions is therefore essential if we are to build upon our limited victories. Where's the sound? Uh, we'll go back. You know what happened to the sound on that? Where are they? Anybody there? <laughs> Believe in freedom. And unless we are willing to take arms to defend our heritage, we cannot call ourselves patriotic Americans. I'm proud to be free. I'm proud to be an American. And if the man we elected president decides that our freedoms are being threatened and that the world must be made safe for democracy, then I know I won't be alone in the heating the call of patriotism. What is this war about? Each man will have his own answer. I have mine. I'm ready to be called! <laughs> now, tonight we have with us the son of Margaret and the late C.J. Reed of Portland, who has witnessed this war firsthand. And I, for one, see no reason why we here at the Liberal Club shouldn't listen to what Jack Reed has to say. What would you say this war is about, Jack Reed? Prophets. <laughs> 
Miss Bryant, can't you grasp that J.P. Morgan has loaned England and France a billion dollars, and if Germany wins, he won't get it back? More coffee? America would be entering the war to protect J.P. Morgan's money. If he loses it, we'll have a depression. So the real question is, why do we have an economy where the poor have to pay so the rich won't lose money? So in Baghdad, have anybody seen that before? Hasn't been on American TV? That was Donald Rumsfeld, the U.S. Department of Defense Secretary, meeting with Saddam Hussein in Iraq, shaking hands, arranging for the next deal to send weapons and agricultural products to Iraq. It's been wiped out of history. So uh, this was on December 20th, 1983. They make a deal, Donald Rumsfeld and Saddam Hussein. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld at that time was special envoy of President Ronald Reagan. Later he became Secretary of Defense under George Bush. Iraq was dependent on buying large amounts of grain as well as armaments from the United States with the billions of dollars in foreign aid supplied by the U.S. government. So the U.S. government is what we just saw in the film, we saw John Reed, played by Warren Beatty in the movie Reds, and Diane Keaton playing Louise Bryant in this great movie, one of the, in my view, one of the best movies I've ever seen, asking how is it that we make these deals? How, why would people question anything about what's going on in terms of the deals and the governments and everything? And here we just saw Donald Rumsfeld making the deal on behest of the U.S. corporations with Saddam Hussein. Eight years later, the U.S. began bombing Iraq. Rumsfeld had by then returned to his post as chair of Searle Pharmaceutical Corporation and later as chair of the Gilead Sciences. And just a side note, Gilead owned the patent for Tamiflu when people, so, for a while, Rumsfeld profited from the selling, the mass selling of Tamiflu all across the United States, which was advertised on TV after 9-11 and especially after the anthrax attacks in 2001. So the link between U.S. pharmaceutical companies, the people in power, who's making the rules and decisions, all comes as a circle, and they go around there, and I call it the revolving door, right, of who's in power, who's making the rules, who's in government, who's in the corporations, and they go around and around. It doesn't matter who's the president. It doesn't matter if it's a Democrat or a Republican. They all do the same thing with the same people. So Rumsfeld returned as chair of Gilead Sciences, and after heading the CIA, President George Bush became a director of pharmaceutical giant Eli Lilly, which also helped to bankroll Giuliani's campaign when he was running for president. Lilly was owned by the family, it still is, owned by the family of arch-conservative vice president Dan Quayle. So what did he say? A mind... I forgot his saying, a mind is a, not a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Something like a waste is a terrible thing to waste. The, what? To lose, right. A mind is a terrible thing to lose. <laughs> that was Dan Quayle's great quote. So then the West Nile virus was first, uh, when the virus was first detected in New York City in 1999 under Giuliani, U.S. government officials falsely considered it a bioterrorist attack by Iraq's president, Saddam Hussein. Wow. Who remembers that? Nobody. Who supposedly had sent the virus to New York City. This was the only way that we were able to get funds originally to fight against West Nile virus or to do anything at all around that was to frame it 
as a bioterrorist attack, even though every scientist and their mother knew, who we interviewed en masse, knew that it wasn't a bioterrorist attack. This was all ridiculous. It was like a month later, it was pushed out of the press. But they felt that the only way they could get money from the federal government to help New York City at the time was to frame it that way, thus setting in motion a whole way of thinking that has plagued us, I believe, ever since. Here's a spraying, what the spraying of New York looked like in part from the spray trucks going around the city. This slide was um, gotten when several of us jumped in a car and chased around the spray trucks as they went and we tried to cut them off and other people tried to run up and let the air out of the tires or or people did, and people risked, actually, we didn't realize it at the time how much we were risking, didn't have gas masks, didn't, people just ran up to it and, you know, and tried to block the trucks from poisoning kids because there were all these children, especially, in the way of the spray, and that was, they didn't care. They just didn't care, and they still don't. They're still spraying by truck, even though we won our lawsuit, but I'll get to that in a little bit. Here's a, Van Howell did this great drawing. Van Howell from out here on Long Island originally. A great artist. This is Mayor Giuliani in his helicopter. And here he is again. Been in the news a little bit lately, I hear. Hasn't changed at all. In the early 1900s, U.S. Marine Corps commander, Smedley Butler, his major general, Smedley Butler, minced no words in reflecting upon his own role in conquering other countries at the behest of the banks and the U.S. corporations. Again, he's the head of the Marine Corps in the United States. I spent 33 years and four months in active military service as a member of this country's most agile military force, the Marine Corps. I served in all commissioned ranks from second lieutenant to major general. And during that period, I spent most of my time being a high class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street, and for the banks. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I suspected I was just part of a racket at the time. Now I'm sure of it. Like all the members of the military profession, I never had a thought of my own until I left the service. My mental faculties remained in suspended animation while I obeyed the orders of the higher-ups. This is typical with everyone in the military service. I helped make Mexico, especially Tampico, safe for the American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National Citibank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. The record of racketeering is long. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1909 and 1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for American sugar interests in 1916. In China, I helped to see that Standard Oil went its way unmolested. During those years, I had, as the boys in the back room would say, a swell racket. Looking back on it, I feel that I could have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was to operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. People ever hear of this, of Smedley Butler? Great hero of, he was a hero of the United States in many ways, first in the Marine Corps, but especially when he came out, he, he's a, he also wrote a book called War is a Racket, and just denounced and looked at US policy and how he was instrumental in being used to take over other countries around the world and to use the land in those countries for the U.S. corporations and what was grown on the land for U.S. corporations, as well as the labor and the resources there. In 1934, Smedley Butler, U.S. Marine Corps commander, testified before the U.S. Congress 
that he had been offered millions of dollars to lead an insurrection and stage a fascist coup against Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And he named names. The coup was funded by corporate behemoths headed by DuPont and J.P. Morgan. Those names sound familiar? Here's uh, one of his books, The Plot to Overthrow the President, a book about Smedley Butler that came out a couple of years ago. Again, it's down the memory hole of but it, what he revealed and many other people is the interrelationship of the U.S. government and U.S. corporations in promoting the takeover of other countries for all sorts of different reasons, and I would argue for genetic engineering as a fundamental aspect of that policy, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. DuPont, let's hear it for DuPont. Better livings for, better things for better living through chemistry. Great. Let's hear it again. <laughs> this is a, uh, how, what we think of, how we think, Philip's milk of amnesia. <laughs> we don't remember these things, we never taught these things, or we forget them in the deluge of other stuff that is ultimately insignificant compared to what we are facing and drives what's important out of our heads and out of our lives. So in 1934, Smedley Butler, again, this is it again, I said let's hear it again, but I'm not gonna read it again. You want me to read it again? Yeah. Okay. In 1934, U.S. Marine Corps Commander Smedley Butler testified before the United States Congress that he had been offered millions of dollars to lead an insurrection and stage a fascist coup against President Franklin Roosevelt. And he named names. The coup was headed and funded by corporate behemoths, DuPont and J.P. Morgan. Roosevelt, actually, he knew that he was told this, he found out, he just sat on that information for different reasons, political reasons that were happening at the time, didn't really do anything with that information. So this is my own, uh, what I like to think of, I go, what? <laughs> Duh! <laughs> it just blows away some of the things we learned, so I like this slide called uh, Mental Floss. This is from Occupy Wall Street. No, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. In the last few years, and it's happening right now, DuPont, same DuPont, and Dow merged their extensive agricultural provisions into a new entity called Corteva Agriscience. Syngenta merged with ChemChina. Bayer bought Monsanto for $66 billion. They became the biggest seed company and the largest agrochemical company on the planet, owning and controlling almost 25% of the world's seeds. Add in BASF, and together those four huge corporations own and control 80% of the world's seeds, almost all genetically engineered to withstand particular pesticides like Roundup. Some actually generate pesticides themselves, turning each cell of the plant into a pesticide factory. Those pesticides won't wash off no matter how much you scrub. They're in each cell. We eat it. And the same companies manufacturing pesticides that are poisoning us also manufacture vaccines and sell us the drugs for treating those diseases that their own chemicals are causing. Think about that. Should we look at it again? Somebody else read it. Read it aloud. So, okay. The same companies... So they're sending us complete cycle 
of, this is uh, by John Jonick. So we have the Acme Chemical Company on the left, Acme Cancer Cure Company in the middle, and Acme Hospital Corp. <laughs> trying to show the loop. The economic profits made by those companies are enormous. We must fight to take the profits and private patenting out of all aspects of research, development, manufacture, and marketing of pesticides. GMOs and vaccines, uh, take it out of GMOs, vaccines, and pesticides, and out of the military, and out of serving the expansive interests of U.S. corporations abroad. Take out the profits, and everything will change. Take out the private patenting, and everything will change. That is one of the first things that our movement has to do, is not just say, we're opposed to this pesticide, we're, not, we're opposed to glyphosate. Yes, we are. But we're opposed to the whole private patenting operation, and we need to fight for that, to raise that. In some other countries, they're doing that. But in the United States, it's, it's almost, uh, it's extremely difficult to raise that in a society, in a capitalist society, which is based on exactly that, ex a private patenting, the profit motive, so forth. If we do that, the entire falsified scientific framework will collapse. And that's a good thing. But the democratic version of the Green New Deal doesn't do that. It's up to us to force the issue. So in the Green New Deal, what's missing? Opposition to nuclear power is not part of the Democratic version. The Green Party version of the Green New Deal covers all this, but the Democratic Party version doesn't. So it's leaving out opposition to nuclear power. Opposition to genetically modified organisms. And the picture is from a demonstration in Ghana where people were protesting against genetically engineered crops being taking over their land. Opposition to mass application of pesticides. This is a slide, uh, a painting by Robert Letterman. Robert Letterman voted for Giuliani in the first time around. He later became, he was shocked by what Giuliani was doing and he changed and he later became uh, one of the founders of the No Spray Coalition with me and about four or five other people in New York when we founded it. I was standing next to a side story. I was standing next to Robert Letterman who really got under Giuliani's skin because he would paint slogans about Giuliani and Hitler. And I mean, he felt personally betrayed as well as politically betrayed because he was duped. He fell into all of that. And he, uh, so I'm standing with him at the Brooklyn Museum and at a protest there and Giuliani's car drives up with people and I see that I'm standing right next to him, right here, and we're just talking and Giuliani points to him and the cop, the captain of the police force, I guess, of that segment comes over. Are you Robert Letterman? Yes. Handcuffed him right there, doing nothing and just dragged him off. Yeah, he's okay. He's, uh, he's moved out of New York City, but he, uh, he's been arrested, I don't know what it was, 30 or 40 times now for freedom of speech only, freedom of speech issues, for painting a sign, for using his artwork to protest what's going on, and he's won every single case, including three before the, I believe it's three before the U.S. Supreme Court at the time, and well, good luck with that now, but... So here's a quote from Giuliani. Let's all read this aloud together. It'll help us think about it. So let's say, freedom is about authority. Freedom is about the willingness of every single human being to cede to lawful authority a great deal of discretion about what you do. This is his understanding of freedom. That was from the New York Times in 1994, where they quoted him. Also missing from the Green New Deal is opposition to the military-industrial pharmaceutical complex. No mention of it at all.
nuclear power, genetic engineering, pesticides, pharmaceutical, industrial, military complex, all missing from what we're all, many of us are taking as our hope in Congress. And, and the Republican majority is even opposing this, which boggles the mind since the Democrats are sort of supporting it. So that's a picture of uh, Brian Tokar. Brian is the author of Monsanto, Origins of an Agribusiness Behemoth, and one of the foremost organizers opposing the genetic engineering of crops. And I give Brian, along with Vandana Shiva, and a few other people credit, um, Ronnie Cummins from Organic Consumers Association, much credit for initiating the movement in the United States against genetic engineering when everybody else was thinking, oh, this is a wonderful thing. It will help us. It will help us feed the world. Jimmy Carter's great statement, a terrible statement, in uh, August 25th, 1987 our, uh, op-ed in the New York Times. Jimmy Carter wrote, why we need genetic engineering to help feed the world. So for decades, ecology activists have been targeting the Monsanto company, its herbicides and genetically engineered crops, as the embodiment of an industry that will do anything it can get away with for profit. Regardless, they don't care how much damage it does to the environment or how much it causes and damage it causes and havoc it wreaks on human health and I might add animals and on just our whole surroundings. Monsanto, people know this, so I'm going over familiar territory here I believe because Jeff Smith and everybody else talked, talked about this extensively for many years and yesterday and the day before as well, Monsanto had engineered its Roundup Ready corn and soy to withstand its Roundup herbicide. For the company, it's a lucrative technological fix where an herbicide is patented and plants are engineered to tolerate that chemical while everything else is destroyed when you spray it. So there's nothing else left standing except that one crop, which allows farmers and I won't even blame farmers, it allows what we call farmers, which is the giant corporate monocrop areas of, of the world. Uh, it allows them to just mass spray over and over and over again because it doesn't really kill the crop. But everything else is gone. Not only do genetically engineered foods poison us directly, the pesticides applied to them poison us a second time. So genetic engineering my conclusion of this part is uh, an essential component of the new globalization of capital. And going back to Smedley Butler, here I'm making the claim that genetic engineering is totally necessary for the expansion of capitalism around the world, which needs to, capitalism needs to expand, right, corporations in order to continue to exist in this type of a system. GMOs provide private corporations and the governments they conquer, they control, sorry. GMOs provide private corporations and the governments they control with the means to conquer, patent, and profit from those parts of life that have thus far stood outside of the capitalist control, the inner workings of our living cell, what Vandana Shiva calls biopiracy. The United States uses GM crops and now trees, which is coming online now, ge gen genetically modified trees, and the pesticides they require to disrupt the economies of other countries, forcing them into dependency. The result of US police action in Somalia in 1992, for example, was the planting of thousands of acres of GMO cassava, disrupting local communities which have been based for centuries on the planting of cassava. And that's uh, from an article by Richard Levins, great Richard Levins, the great scientist. He co-wrote the book that you might want to check out called The Dialectical Biologist. It's one of the best books on science that you could ever hope to read. Following the US bombing of Iraq in 2004, 
U.S. appointed administrator of the coalition provisional of the coalition provisional authority, L. Paul Bremer, issued Executive Order 81, prohibiting farmers from saving seeds from genetically engineered crops and making it illegal for the farmers to replant them. This was a consequence of the war in Iraq, of the bombing of Iraq, just as with Somalia. Bremer's edict was part and parcel of the IMF's structural adjustment program. In Haiti, the IMF openly stated its goal of confiscating one-third of all rural lands from peasants and turning them over to agribusiness to produce heavily pesticide export crops, sugar, coffee, cotton. So formerly self-sufficient peasants were driven from their lands. And this is part of a plan. We actually have this in writing. One of the few, I mentioned last night, we have one of the few documents where it actually spells this out in black and white. Where we're going to remove a third of the people from their lands so that they could work in export zones. Some Haitian laborers were sold as slaves under the U.S. supported dictator, Baby Doc Duvalier, to the sugar plantations of the Dominican Republic. I'm not using the word slaves euphemistically. These are slaves. They were contracted for by the, with the government of Haiti at the time, the regime in Haiti, by the Dominican uh, Republic. Others ended up in sweatshops and assembly zones where even the pretense of environmental regulation, unions, minimum wages, and health and safety conditions does not exist. And here's Papa Doc Duvalier with Nelson Rockefeller. Hello, glad to see you, old friend. Export zones in Mexico, they're known as maquiadoras, are the inner circle of Dante's Inferno, neoliberal regions of vast and depraved exploitation where toxic waste, I call them the effluence of affluence, pour into the streets. Almost all U.S. food aid to the victims of the tsunami in the South Pacific, to earthquake victims in Pakistan and Puerto Rico, is genetically engineered and saturated with pesticides. U.S. foreign policy has long fingers. It finds ever new ways to squeeze profits, power, and control from indigenous cultures. Here's George H.W. Bush. This is our, we made a huge banner out of this and we carried it in the No War for Oil demonstrations back in the late 70s and early 80s. Can everybody see the slide from over there? Okay. Secret Monsanto documents revealed it targeted activists opposing the, w, the World Trade Organization, such as in Seattle in 1999. In Seattle 99, African countries met with activists and resisted being forced to plant or eat GM crops, the critical factor in rejection of the agreement. Here's Seattle in 1999. I think I was sitting right in or standing right <laughs> on the bottom there and trying to get out of the way of the spray. Anybody else here in Seattle in 99? Even though the protest against the International Monetary Fund's structural adjustment policies really began in Africa and Latin America, when it hit Seattle in 99 against the World Trade Organization, that's when it really began taking off here in the United States, and protesters and organizers followed around the WTO, the attempts to organize it, all around. It was going on for like about four or five years, uh, and by 2001, one of the effects of the attacks on the tower in 2001 and the repression that followed it was to crush that movement, which is, so let's put two and two together here. So in Seattle, uh, this was the beginning, or maybe the high point and beginning of the movement here in the United States against genetic engineering and the mass spraying of pesticides and the IMF structural adjustment. 
Later learned that those spray in the, uh, that the police were using were contained malathion and other organophosphates. They contracted, the police there had contracted with the various government parties here. There were like something like 26 different kinds of police that were there from all over, not just local Seattle police, but federal police, police I never heard of, agencies I had no idea existed. And as the Monsanto trials currently underway at, are revealing, the true results in Monsanto's experiments were concealed not only by Monsanto, but by government regulators who are supposed to be protecting us and not corporate profits. Concealed in the Monsanto records are ghost-written research attributed to academics. Tracy Malkin, uh, Stacy Malkin talked about that last night. Proof that senior EPA officials quashed government reviews of glyphosate that would have been conducted by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And that's uh, actually, that was one of the few things that actually appeared in the New York Times about the documents. These, uh, Jonathan Latham says, he's the executive director of the Bioscience Research Project and has a chapter on this in my book, as does Stacy Malkin. These Monsanto concealed documents represent a tremendous trove of previously hidden or lost evidence on chemical regulatory activity and chemical safety, heavily focused on the activities of regulators. Time and again, says Jonathan Latham, we regulators went to extreme lengths of setting up secret committees, deceiving the media and the public, and covering up evidence of human exposure and human harm. These secret activities extended and increased human exposure to chemicals they knew to be toxic, which is why the juries now are coming out heavy against Monsanto over in, the, in three trials now, and the fourth one is now underway. Three trials, they won, one trial won three quarters of a billion dollars, another trial won two billion dollars against Monsanto, and then uh, I forget what the third one went, and now the fourth one is underway, and now they're trying, Monsanto is, and Bayer, which now owns Monsanto, is trying to, our friendly aspirin company, Bayer, is trying to manufacture, um, well, they're trying to, come up with a, a way of, so that they don't have to pay out all these billions of dollars and then set up a pool and have, there are now 20,000 lawsuits that have been filed against Monsanto and maybe 100,000 people part of that potentially and facing over a trillion dollars in fines. And the juries have been outraged at Monsanto, because of these hidden documents, it's not just that these poisons affect people, but how Monsanto knew this, and so did the U.S. government, and they lied about it, covered up, worked in secret together. That's what these documents are now showing, and we wouldn't have known that without the trials, even though we suspected it, but we wouldn't have gotten all the documents without these trials that are now underway. So the first case that came to trial against Monsanto was heard just last, uh, a year and a half ago, <laughs> it seems like a decade ago by now, the plaintiff's name was Dwayne Johnson. He suffered from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma caused by Monsanto's Roundup. His legal team presented documents that Monsanto had been keeping secret, which revealed government collusion with Monsanto. The jury voted unanimously to award Johnson who is a school groundskeeper, a quarter of a billion dollars in punitive as well as actual damages. And Johnson is a real hero. This is Dwayne Johnson. Um, maybe we could give him a, a round. <laughs> Monsanto's own scientist, Donna Pharma, informed the company that you cannot say, this is a quote from her, that you cannot say that Roundup is not a carcinogen. We have not done the necessary testing on the formulation to make that statement. The testing on the formulations are not anywhere near the level of the active ingredient glyphosate. So in other words, they tested glyphosate, which is poison, 
But they didn't even do the testing on the rest of Roundup, which now we're finding out includes POEAs, which is surfactants, and also now arsenic inside Roundup. As a result of the judgment in favor of Johnson and a subsequent plaintiffs, there are currently, as I said, 100,000 plaintiffs who have signed to file lawsuits against Monsanto, alleging that the exposure to Roundup caused them or their family members to become ill with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a form of cancer, and that Monsanto suppressed that research. New cases are coming to trial. They are now responsible for $1 trillion in Roundup-related lawsuits is seeking to settle all of them from a fund that might cost Bayer $8 billion, which is a bargain for Bayer, because it's only around 12.5% of what it paid to buy Monsanto. One attorney, Mike Miller, of, on our side, is holding out, convinced that injured plaintiffs deserve much more than what they would get from these type of settlements, and his resistance to settling with Bayer could either scuttle or end up strengthening the proposed deal. We don't know which way it's going to go. But that's what's happening right now, today. I mean, today the trial is going on, literally, in, in St. Louis. Although they are trying to suspend it, they adjourned it so that they can try and get the settlement together. So new research now links Roundup to more and more illnesses, and not only non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so Bayer wants to set up the compensation fund quickly and avoid thousands of usually expensive court cases. But glyphosate has been shown to be linked to autism with, cog with cognitive impairment, according to the British Medical Journal in March 2019. And Stephanie Seneff, the MIT scientist who also has a chapter in the book, proposed that glyphosate exposure, let me show you the book. This is the book I'm talking about. Not that you can see it, but. So this is the book uh, that just came out earlier this year that I wrote and put together. And all these people have, and you can get it outside if you want to. Um, Stephanie Seneff has a chapter in there explaining a lot of this, and she proposed that glyphosate exposure is linked to autism prior to prior to the publication in the medical journal that we talked about. So she was the first, or one of the first, to propose this, and she was scoffed at, as are so many alternative scientists, and especially as are so many women scientists who are scoffed at and treated patriarchically as well as, and dismissed. Certain, uh, she writes, certain vaccine viruses, including measles and MMR and flu virus, are grown on gelatin derived from the ligaments of pigs fed heavy doses of glyphosate in their GMO feed. Livestock feed is allowed to have up to 400 parts per million of glyphosate residues by the EPA, 400, million, uh, 400 parts per million of glyphosate residues by the EPA, thousands of times higher than has been shown to cause harm in numerous studies. Glyphosate is also used as a drying agent. It's called a desiccant and has been found in Quaker Oats, Ben and Jerry's ice cream, and leading orange juice brands. New findings reveal that children's vaccines, as well as popular brands of wine and beer, are contaminated with a cancer-causing pesticide. Which beer? I don't know which brands. That uh, the Organic Consumers Association has a website that lists all of these things. And so I recommend that you go to them. Here's Ben and Jerry's. They initiated this campaign against Ben and Jerry's because of, which was no longer owned by Ben and Jerry's, who were decent guys. Right? It's owned by Unilever, Unilever, which is a major U.S. giant corporation that's throughout Latin America and the United States. So Ben & Jerry's is uh, the third, I wrote, the $1.3 billion subsidiary of Unilever. 
Today's pesticides used for killing weeds and so-called pests have their origins, all pesticides used today have their origins in the nerve gas developed by the Nazis in World War II and also by the British in World War II and the, and the US to a lesser extent. One, one thing I learned in my research was something I had never heard of. It was called in 1917 in the US at the border, there was something called the Bath Riots, B-A-T-H. Who knew? Again, another thing we never heard of. People coming legally from Mexico and going back and forth across the border to work in the, on our crops in the agricultural fields in California and Arizona, and they would go back and forth across the border regularly. They were being sprayed or fumigated with it turned out to be what later became Zyklon B, which was used by the Nazis in the concentration camps in the gas chambers, and it started here before it got transformed to these ulterior purposes. And so people finally rebelled, people coming from Mexico finally rebelled against how they were being treated. Sounds familiar. And, and there was a whole series of riots that went on for a period of time in 1917 that uh, so check out, just Google bath riots, and it'll, it should pop up. You know, you think, why are people leaving their land to begin with? People don't want to leave. I don't want to leave where I live necessarily, although it might be a good idea. <laughs> but most people don't want to leave their homelands. They do it because they feel forced to, for one reason or another. In Mexico's case, because people are being uprooted from their lands and they can't sustain their own farming and they can't, and their corn, which all their communities are being based on, is being ravaged by U.S. and other corporations dumping or trying to jump, dump genetically engineered corn onto the market and selling it at cheaper prices and growing in order to take over their land. So food, as we'll see later, food is not just, uh, you know, all this stuff, genetic engineering, is not just about making an immediate profit with a pesticide. It's also a means of empire, a means of expanding the empire, of colonialism. So Monsanto, Dow, Bayer, DuPont, and other agribusiness and pharmaceutical corporations work closely with the Pentagon and the Veterans Administration in developing herbicides like 245T, a component of Agent Orange, sprayed extensively by the US military in Vietnam and responsible for contamination of water supplies, rice paddies, and forests. Agent Orange has caused devastating and debilitating illnesses in civilians and soldiers, chromosomal damage, and deformities in children with effects in Vietnam and in the US lasting to this day. Monsanto and Dow intentionally falsified key data on the effects of Agent Orange on human health, once again. We should have known that when they went to have Roundup approved by looking at the whole history of how they lied, but they never did because they were working in cahoots. So decades of mass spraying of corn and soy fields with Monsanto's Roundup have poisoned the nation's waters with arsenic, contributing to the skyrocketing rates of many types of cancer across the United States. We could ask, what did Monsanto's corporate officers and US and European government officials, yes, European officials are involved in this as well, even though they try to pretend that they're not when they pose a sort of a, a faux resistance. Some of it is real, but some of it is being pushed and is not real, it's, and the corporations are trying to fight it, it's, are trying to work with those, not work with, but trying to twist the arms of those officials all over the world to approve of Roundup used in those countries. So what did they know and when did they know it? Same question we asked in the past of during Watergate, right? So here's a, an art, artwork by Hayden Anderson, who's an artwork artist in San Francisco, 
where, she, where you have Humphrey Bogart and Claude Rains there from Casablanca going, Monsanto stands exposed, round up the usual suspects. Admiral Zumwalt, who is the commander of the US Navy forces in Vietnam, said that Monsanto endows Agent Orange was politically motivated, the way, the way it got approved, to cover up the true effects of dioxin and manipulate public perception. In 2018, Vietnam, not the United States, finally banned the spraying of the herbicides Paraquat and 2,4-D. Finally, after 40 years, 50 years. Despite what we have been led to believe, neither pesticides nor genetically engineered agriculture are needed, even if they would work, which they don't, to assure the world's food supply. This is a myth promulgated by the industry and government. While it doesn't increase, Jeff, Jeff Smith made this point last night. Look, he answered in one sentence, it doesn't increase crop yield, this is a lie. And then he sat back down. <laughs> right. right, we don't need all these words, but it shows in a larger context, factory farming that it promotes and the monoculturing that it promotes are the ways in which the GMO pesticides industry uproots the commons and steals the resources of the global south and Africa, reminiscent of the European ruling class's theft of the silver and gold extracted from South America during the conquest of the New World. And in 1492, the indigenous people discovered Christopher Columbus on their beach. This is uh, the cover of Eduardo Galeano's great book, The Open Veins of Latin America, where he just goes into the mining of silver and the conquistadors. Also, I might add Howard Zinn's book, The People's History of the United States. The very first chapter is loaded with heart-wrenching information about what happened to the American Indians following the arrival of conquerors from Europe starting in 1492 and going on for a couple hundred, three or four hundred years. So monocropping, as we know, facilitates diseases, allows them to spread quickly across entire fields. I say you have a field that has only one crop, nothing in between the rows. Farmers know you don't grow crops that way. But corporate farming doesn't care because they have these huge amount of resources and now they could just spray over a whole field so that you don't, you don't kill other plants, except uh, you don't kill the crops that you want to pick, you kill everything else in the field. And monocropping facilitates that. Here's a protest in Washington Square Park in New York on Millions for Monsanto Day. There have been marches every year for, uh, called Millions for Monsanto, uh, Millions Against Monsanto, sorry. In Argentina and Brazil, huge swaths of primeval rainforest are being cut down to enable genetically engineered soy to be monocropped for animal feed and biofuels exported to the US, Japan, China, and Europe. One of the main opponents of the use of biofuels, of growing crops to extract fuels from corn especially, or sugarcane, uh, one of the main opponents of that was surprisingly Fidel Castro. Again, nobody hears, learns that Fidel Castro was a lead for the last 20 years of his life, was a leading environmental advocate and opponent of these giant corporations. Not only are the corporations as capitalists, but scientifically and ecologically. And it was quite amazing because nobody knew that either. In Indonesia, millions of acres of forest have been burned for palm oil production, for mining, and for cattle grazing. In Mexico, the Lacandona Forest, the home of the ancient Mayan people, and the Zapatista Rebellion, which is located there as well, 
is under siege by international paper companies as much as by federal troops. The planting and importing of GMOs are banned only in seven countries. Nigeria, Bhutan, Kyrgyzstan, Madagascar, Peru, Venezuela, and Russia. Russia being the most populous country to ban both the cultivation and importation of GM crops. So U.S. hands off Venezuela. It gives a whole new dimension to another aspect of what's involved here. And here's a, it says, if you can't read it, uh, this is Vladimir Putin. He said, Russia needs to, pro oh no, this is um, the people who put this together, said Russia needs to protect the citizens from GMOs. People should be protected from harmful products or products that have unidentified and unforeseen consequences for humans, especially when used for food. This one he got right. Maybe for the wrong reasons, maybe for the right reasons, but they banned it in, in Russia. I think the reason, the main reason for that is because they want to compete with the United States in agriculture so they could sell GMO-free and organic food. But hey, you know, we, we sort of take our victories where we can these days. And the battery is running low. You know, uh, yeah, I thought this was plugged in. So we'll take a break for a second. Well, yeah, well, it's not clicking. Yes. Could be, or it could be from Brookhaven Labs and the nuclear radiation that's being released into the water supply. I went to, I went to Stony Brook for years, and we all knew not to drink the water there, and especially around towns on the southern, more south, and also towards Brookhaven, because of the just the poisoning of the water from agricultural runoff as well as the nuclear power plant. It was really dangerous. Uh, I think it's been, a, and they're tearing down the, oh, the flash drive. Sorry, finish in a minute. get that chemical dioxin type products. So could be from that too, besides just DDT spraying from decades ago. And that's uh, Robin Esser, PhD person who also has a chapter in the book on, on the lies that Monsanto has told and how scientifically they're wrong and what's wrong with which we don't always do. We argued about that politically and ecologically, but she also goes through the science behind their lies. Uh, this is a, a photo of me on the far right there at Monsanto's headquarters, along with Maris Abelson on the left from the Green Party in New York and others from St. Louis. So we traveled out and we were part of the early demonstrations at Monsanto's actual plant. Now I, and now I can't finish my talk because I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> the, 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 main, um, the main purposes of the talk that I want is for us to think differently. I'm s sorry I had a lot more graphics. To think differently about what we do. Why is it that Governments all around the world have continued to use glyphosate and Roundup, even though all of this is well known now. It's been known for years. So why? Okay, now I have to. What, where do I see it? 
Okay. Ah. So. Well, I would walk over here. Is, is there a mic that you have? Another mic that I could walk around with? So the idea is that, one of the ideas is that we question why it is, and I hope that this PowerPoint and presentation answers some of that. Thank you. And also, we want to know what we can do about it. How do we, as I mentioned earlier at the beginning, we don't want to just do it anymore, one pesticide at a time, one pipeline at a time. We want to figure out ways of uprooting this whole way of thinking and of power politics that are implementing these different policies that are messing up our lives and our world. So this is supposed to go forward. Ah, there it is. So here we have Home Depot, one of the largest uh, providers of pesticided and of Roundup. You go into there and they have Roundup available. I would ask everyone here to go into your local Home Depot. The nice thing about them being everywhere is that there's a Target everywhere. I mean, it's, Home Depot has a Target, not just a Target store. And you can go in there and ask them to get rid of the Roundup. And if enough people do that and put pressure on them, that would be, uh, we'll have a success that way. This is Reverend Billy on, on the left. Reverend Billy is a, a great performer in New York and Savitri, and the two of them do the Church of Stop Shopping. And they went out, also went out to Monsanto and they, in the middle of the winter, and they stood outside and they did a performance called Monsanto is the Devil and the Devil Must Be Slain. And they have a whole troupe that together Act, it was over 30 people that they took out together to go out to St. Louis and to demonstrate there. Here's a, another graphic. Okay, now, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger approves of the IMF structural adjustment and USAID programs. He wants, which is the main source for genetic engineering and pesticides around the world. He once portrayed American aid this way. To give food aid to a country just because they are starving is a pretty weak reason. Kissinger is the instrument, the person who helped manufacture US foreign policy for five decades now. And to think that he, he's right in what he says here. Not morally right, but he's right that this is what U.S. aid is about. It's about ways of taking over land in other countries, booting people off the land. We're not giving them food aid to feed them. We're giving it for other reasons. So for Kissinger, food is to be used as a weapon in the achievement of U.S. foreign policy objectives. And so the United States systematically dumps cheap, genetically engineered, products saturated with pesticides on foreign markets, undermining local producers and forcing them to purchase the patented seeds from the company manufacturing them. They're not allowed to replant them, along with the pesticides needed to kill off the plant's competitors. Driven from their lands, local producers become dependent on the United States and its corporations, and a number of them try to flee across the border to the United States. On the other hand, people know Anthony Bourdain, the world famous chef who died, was it last year? I'm not gonna speculate here for the purposes of this talk. He wrote, once you've been to Cambodia, and who knew this about Anthony Bourdain? Once you've been to Cambodia, you'll never stop wanting to beat Henry Kissinger to death with your bare hands. You will never again be able to open a newspaper and read about that treacherous, prevaricating, murderous scumbag sitting down for a nice chat with Charlie Rose of 
and attending some black tie affair for a new glossy magazine without choking. Witness what Henry did in Cambodia, the fruits of his genius for gamesmanship. And you'll never understand why he's not sitting in the deck in The Hague next to Milosevic. Uh, shortly before he died, and we can all speculate about all sorts of things from that. This is a piece I wrote, which is some of it is reprinted in the book called West Nile, The West Nile Story, in which in New York we blocked the spray trucks, we went the lawsuits route. It's really important for activists. Many of the mainstream environmental groups refused to help us to stop the spraying, whether it was NRDC, went and visited them like a half a dozen times. No, uh, there are other mainstream groups, large corporate mainstream groups, environmental groups. They didn't want to touch it. And then, uh, anyway, th this is, uh, who is this? Yes, this is Rachel Carson, true hero of our movement. Her book in 1962, Silent Spring, intersected with the mass movement that was happening at the time. One of the things to learn from that movement against DDT and for the banning of DDT in the United States, which involved all these people marching, I mean, it was her, story was put out week by week in the New Yorker. And so it, people read it in sequels rather than all at once before the whole book came out. And it was quite incredible that she kept going and analyzing what was going on. But also, are people aware that it wasn't only about DDT? It was also about the nuclear bomb testing as a result of the Cold War in the United States which was poisoning, the strontium-90 levels were poisoning the children throughout the country, the milk supply throughout the country. And that was a fundamental part, along with DDT, of what Rachel Carson and the movement were demanding and marching and mobilizing everywhere. And it was, again, many, many young women who were part of this movement. There were men, too, who were part of it, but it was initiated by women, again. So we owe... I always like to remember Rachel Carson. Now this, okay. We're coming near the end, and I wanted to mention, this is the FDA badge, the Food and Drug Administration badge. It is actual badge that we stole, uh, sorry, liberated from the FDA officials at one point. Well, we say that FDA means for direct action. And people in, in Boston and in other parts of Massachusetts took these, you, you notice the picture proves who you are, right? It's, a, it's the picture. <laughs> and, uh, and it's signed by the commissioner of health at the time and the commissioner of the FDA at the time. And, we, and they went into, I, I was not part of this particular one, they went into stores throughout the area dressed in zoot suits, uh, in those um, radiation suits, and went in with Geiger counters and everything and said, oh, would say, sorry, we have to shut down your store. You have to get rid of these, you have to get rid of these products and shut down or else shut down the store. And it was whatever products that they knew were genetically engineered. So they went to product after product after product and told the store managers to get rid of them. And they had the official badge and here's my proof. And of course they see their picture, so of course it's true. And, and they managed to succeed in shutting down several stores. In Tennessee, this type of creative actions are going on everywhere. In Tennessee, there was another small group of activists who decided to rewrite the law book. So you know those uh, McKinney Law, the, their black leather bound law books? So they got one and they rewrote part, the first few pages of it and they just inserted it nicely so it looked real. And it said on number one, you cannot sell genetically food that has been derived from genetically engineered uh, 
products, crops, or bovine growth hormone in the store. And they shut down store after store after store in Tennessee. The owner of the store would come up and say, well, it doesn't say that. That's not in the law. What are you talking about? And they said, yes, it is. Here's the law. And they'd open up the book, and they'd show it to them right there in black and white where it says that. And they succeeded in shutting down, I think it was five or six stores, big ones, before they got wind and they had to get run out of town at the, with, guns, with guns pointing at them. <laughs> but it was, quite a, it was quite a great tactic. In New York, we blocked spray trucks that were poisoning everybody. A lot of the spray truck drivers were getting sick from the spraying themselves. Uh, California, they were spraying marijuana crops and marijuana fields. People shot down the helicopters. It's, I'm not advocating or not advocating anything. I'm just saying what happened. And to try and get us to think about, uh, to break out of the way of thinking that we have to only march in a street where nobody's watching and nobody's listening and chant at windows where nobody is sitting and then go home the next day, which is what a lot of the demonstrations are about these days. We can do a lot more than that. And just with friends, even with a small group of people, just be creative and have fun. And just, it's fun fighting against these bastards. It's like, if you don't enjoy it, what's the point in it, as well as doing something good for the world and for ourselves? So we are a prisoner of uh, the universal price codes, right? The private patenting of everything. This is, uh, I had put these on trees all around New York City when they were going to putting price codes on trees when they were trying to privatize the parks in New York and have them be taken over by or run by private corporations or named by private corporations. And this is from what it looked like during our fight against the spraying. Okay, so I'm gonna, oh, this, I'm sorry. I'm just running through the last of the pictures I pulled out. Uh, this is the actual sheep meadow in Central Park. This is why it's not Photoshopped. This is why it was called the sheep meadow. There used to be sheep grazing there. When we went to Prospect Park, the head of Brooklyn um, parks back when, like 15 years ago, and asked him to stop spraying in the parks, they go, well, what are we going to do? What can we use instead? And we said, well, why don't you use sheep? Well, why don't you use goats? And, you know, this picture was part of that. And they just laughed at us. You know, what? Use goats? Are you crazy? Blah, blah, blah. I tell this story in the book also. And uh, now, finally, there were goats that were used the past few years in parts of Prospect Park who weeded the park in, like, record time. And <laughs> it's just, it's shy. and it was fun for kids to go up and see the goats at work and having fun and enjoying their life. So this is, uh, yeah, this is part of the story of there are all these, I don't know if you could see the cartoons from here. Can you actually see them? These are from John Jonick, who is, uh, his main argument, in addition to being a great cartoonist, is that tobacco is the most pesticided plant on the planet. And there is something like, there's no tobacco in U.S. cigarettes at all. It's all poison, synthesized, it's, unless you get um, the organic version of it. I don't smoke at all, but he does. And, he smokes organic and his own, his own tobacco. But the idea that people are told only that the tobacco itself is what's killing them, when it's also, additionally, and way more dangerously, the pesticides that are being used and the other chemicals that are put into these US cigarettes, again, which has no tobacco in it. So, Mother Jones ran a great expose on that like 20 years ago, and they outlined the whole thing. But again, another thing that we don't know about. So anyway, that's, um, that's pretty much what I have to say. If people want to organize, 
I'll be outside selling books, and you don't have to buy a book, but you could come and sign up on a sign-up sheet if you want to help work together and do uh, organizing, because I don't want to do this talk just for, you know, just for, I mean, it's fun to do, it's fun to meet everybody, but mostly we need to organize each other and mobilize and work together and find ways in which we can reclaim our lives that are being stolen from us. So I have a, about two or three minutes left to take some questions, and I'd be glad to do that. Uh, on Wednesday morning, tomorrow morning, New York City, as I mentioned, will be having a hearing, the city council, at City Hall on whether or not to get rid of Roundup in New York City parks. And if you're able to come, please come. That's at 9 in the morning. Then you could come back here. Yeah, you, know, you could dart back and forth for the talks here. So at City Hall in New York. Yes. City Hall's a big building. So where specifically oh, should you'll, people you'll go? find it. It's, it'll be okay. on the steps. And at what time? At 9 in the morning. And Tomorrow then we're going morning? to be leaving to go to another building altogether where the actual hearing will be held, which is down the block. Thank so, you. Thank you. We're sitting here, and you can go to their website, Green Street Radio. They're out of Port Washington. And I just want to thank Mitchell Cohn because I knew when they came over my house with helicopters and the streets, they did both, helicopters and trucks. I knew it was wrong. I was testifying, but I had no idea what to do. And I met Mitchell Cohn in a Brooklyn park signing his No Spray Coalition petition. And he has been tireless for all these decades for all of us. And I just really appreciate that and that he keeps going. Yeah. So, well, I thank you because I've met Laurie and many other people here as part of the fight. And we're all in this together, but not only to fight, but also to enjoy enjoy that fight and enjoy reclaiming our lives. So again, thanks everyone. Uh, any other questions here? Not that I could see anything at all up here. Where, where are the Monsanto trials occurring? Can we attend them? Yes. Are they available yes. online? Yes, yes. How in, could we access them? They're in, this distance? current one is in St. Louis. And we have a bunch of friends are going there. There were some friends in St. Louis who set up a local no spray coalition just last week. Uh, we didn't try to set, you know, promote other groups to set up. We wanted just to inspire people to do it, but the, uh, all over the country, people set up small anti-pesticide groups, some of them under the title No Spray Coalition, but there's no like charter or decision-making apparatus. Whatever we do with each other that we decide to do. So yes, that are, they're in St. Louis, and you can attend them if you want. Yes, actually, yes. It's surprising. I have no idea. This is all new to me, this uh, <laughs> streaming stuff. Uh, I, you can go to, I think you can go to uh, Stacy Malkin's website, the U U.S. Right to Know, will have on it how to get the trial on, she talked about it last night, to see it if you can't go to it. Mitchell, as of Friday morning, they stopped the trial in St. Louis. This is Jeffrey in the back. You can't see me. No, I can't um, see you. Oh, there you are. They, hey, they, Jeff. Hi. They stopped the trial. Why don't you come up here? Okay. <laughs> this is Jeffrey Smith, who has some of the most amazing and important original books that set off the whole movement. So. Thank you. So um, I learned that on Friday they went into the courtroom ready to do the trial, and then they all the lawyers just left, and they announced that they were trying to get a settlement. So it's an interesting situation where if they want to settle for up to 100,000 plaintiffs, and if they don't settle, then they may televise this, they're expecting to televise this, and there's new documents and new information that has never before been revealed, and Monsanto's employees have to testify 
live, whereas before they only had to be part of depositions because it was in California. So if we have a settlement, it'll be good for all of the plaintiffs and it'll be billions of dollars. And if they don't settle, we'll get more information out of this courtroom drama and it'll be a courtroom drama. Thanks. Chair. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, shout it out. Or, well, here. Um, my question is about the overall goal, because like you mentioned before, um, they'll just start making more toxins, right? And no matter how much we flight, fight glyphosate, there's going to be something new. Like, I believe Monsanto is probably behind, like, Beyond Burger and Impossible Burger and all that stuff. So they're kind of staying ahead of us. So kind of what's the overall goal? How can we basically annihilate them completely? Okay, anybody want to respond to that? <laughs> Come on, this isn't just me being the expert, although... I I think, uh, I think uh, the importance is to, you, to fight against Roundup as we're doing and winning around the world, although at a terrible cost, especially to children and older people who are more susceptible to the sprays, but also using that as a jump off point to attack the entire methodology of the system, the regulatory system the, that are allowing this to continue and a way of thinking. And I know that people here are thinking very differently in the past few years, I bet, I know I am, than I had in the past. I didn't used to think about these things like 25 years ago. I thought about the war and I thought about oppression and people in jail. And I didn't think really about the destruction of the environment much. But now I think enough people are thinking about that. In France, there's a revolution going on as of yesterday. And it's, a, it's amazing. And what's happening in parts of Europe, France, some parts of Germany, is they were opposing generic, genetic engineering overall, not just Roundup, but the entire apparatus of genetic engineering and pesticide spraying. And that's remarkable. And one of the ways that we could get our own government to change policies here when things get hopeless, I think about this, is that we, can't, we almost can't impact on many of these questions our own government here, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, they've all been horrible on these particular issues. They may be different on different issues, but on these issues, they're the same. Is that farmers in the US can't sell their products or their crops to Europe now, so this huge market is being taken away. So it's the farmers, uh, so in, our, we through other governments, through influencing movements and being part of movements elsewhere in the world that are influencing their governments to reject genetically engineered crops and imports to them. We then have a roundabout way of influencing our own government because the government doesn't want to hear from all these farmers saying that they can't sell their products abroad. So this is a roundabout way, but we do have by one of the benefits of being part of a worldwide movement is that there's, that's the benefit to it, that we can influence things through other people that we can't influence directly for ourselves all the time. And then other people around the world that are relying on what we do here as well. People in parts of Africa and Latin America are... I wanted to tell the story, but I didn't. I can't believe I ran out of time. I wanted to tell the story of Seattle, where it was the African delegation that scuttled the entire talks about the WTO and walked out on them over the issue of genetic engineering. They refused to accept genetically, the, the requirement that they plant genetically engineered crops, refused to accept uh, crops that were sent there as genetically engineered material. And it was Africa who saved us, parts of Africa, I think it was Zambia at that time, and, that, and we had met with these delegates for weeks and then they came and made that decision. They didn't actually know much about it. No, none of us knew much about it, except we had people there who did know about it. And they responded where our own government wouldn't. And in turn, it impacted on US government policy. So by being part of a worldwide movement and not limiting it to just 
national, uh, we can really start affecting change and, you know, building up our movements that will be able to revolutionize around the world. Yeah, anybody else? Time, sorry, time out. <laughs> Gee, I'm just getting warmed up now. <laughs> All right, well, thank you.